This evening we are really in the midst of something. And we are dealing with a subject which has taxed the ingenuity of some very able minds. Among them, Mr. Arthur Edward Waite. I think we need, in this case, to say a little something about the author of the book we are going to consider. Uh, Mr. Waite was one of the outstanding writers of his time in the otherwise neglected field of the esoteric arts and sciences. His production in this area was prodigious. And as author, editor, translator, and preface writer, he made available to English-speaking people many rarities of early philosophy and European mysticism that might not yet be available to us. We are most appreciative for his inspiration in contributing to the translation of the Museum Hermeticum, for example. And we likewise deeply appreciate his industry in making available the two large folio volumes on the alchemical writings of Paracelsus. We remember him also as the translator of the French transcendentalist Eliphas Levy. We also know that uh, Mr. Waite was a mystic and poet in his own right. And his book of poems of mystery and vision is an entirely commendable work. We also know from his general literary style that he was a man of ability in these areas. And from his research material that he was by nature a good student. And with the available material in the library of the British Museum at his disposal, he has preserved for us a wonderful bibliography of authors, texts, and books that might otherwise remain comparatively unknown to the modern student. Down through the years, I have gradually assembled the greater part of his original reference material so that probably 80% of the books that he quotes, particularly in the volume under consideration this evening, we have in the original editions. These different activities also relate to another line of his thinking. He was a prominent English mason and wrote considerably on Freemasonry, including encyclopedic works dealing especially with the British point of view on things Masonic. Uh, he had very little sympathy for the American point of view on almost any subject and was essentially first, last, and all the way along an English gentleman with a profound admiration for everything English. Well, as most of his authors were not English, this should not have caused any great amount of consternation. But in looking along and in following many of the difficult courses which he attempted to follow, we do not always find that we can come in accord with his conclusions. All through his writings, we find a peculiar note that detracts from uh, the seriousness which the subjects might justify. For example, in his translations of the writings of the French transcendentalist, Eliphas Levy, Levy uh, who was actually a French priest by the name of Abbe Louis Constant, Waite does an excellent translation and then in the preface apologizes for the original author. He explains definitely that he is not to be 
held responsible for the innumerable mistakes made by the good abbe in his original texts. This is a rather curious point of view. We don't know who is on the defensive, uh, but it looks as though Mr. Waite is very concerned over his reputation. Uh, this was Love's labor lost, however, as the very field in which he was operating must inevitably have ruined his reputation outside of a small group of sympathetic friends. The uh, corporate image of Mr. Waite therefore arises as an individual uh, with a good scholarly mind and a powerful body of preconceptions. Uh, his work on the Brotherhood of the Rosy Cross first appeared in 1924, and I secured my copy in the spring of 1925 when the book was still fresh from the press. Reading it at that time, I noticed in looking it over a few days ago, I made a couple of notes on the title page. Uh, a poor habit, but I didn't intend this book for resale. Uh, the uh, note that uh, is pertinent to the situation is my finding in the first reading of the book. Mr. Waite reasons from conclusions and not toward them. And this, I think, is generally his dilemma throughout nearly all of his writings. He is so desperately for afraid that he will not be respectable. He is so desperately frightened lest his scholarship be questioned that he moves along in a state of caution that becomes, to a degree at least, a little ridiculous considering the nature of the subject matter. Of all his publications, I suppose this book, which was one of his last, might uh, have caused him the greatest difficulty. He undoubtedly had been gathering notes and relative matters for a long time, as his first written work appeared in 1887. Therefore, we have a considerable literary career. Uh, not too long ago, the uh, original papers, manuscripts, and so forth of Mr. Waite were offered at auction and brought a substantial sum. I did not bid on them because most of the manuscripts had already appeared in book form. But uh, throughout his work writings, we find that caution leads him almost inevitably to a strong point of negation. In his effort to be sure that he is not supporting something that is not right, he finally ends up by supporting nothing. Uh, this is not unreasonable, considering the obscuration of the field, but it still leaves us with the mystery about which the book is built remaining unsolved. All he seems to be able to do with it is harvest the winds. This uh, end in itself is not of great importance. The important thing is that he has preserved for us uh, the necessary titles, names, and publication dates of practically every important text in the field. This makes possible that others may follow after him, and picking up the threads of his particular interests may uh, unravel them further. Now, as the book deals primarily with the subject of the Rosicrucians, I think we should try to orient ourselves a little bit in his thinking on the subject. The burden of Mr. Waite's feelings are, the burden is that the Rosicrucian organization was a mystical society completely and entirely esoteric. Uh, that. Uh, almost every contender for a place in the membership of the society was either an optimist or a fraud. That actually, practically every book written in the last hundred years on the subject of Rosicrucianism is a monstrous absurdity. 
uh, that uh, all authors, except himself, are highly prejudiced. Uh, he is different. He is just prejudiced against everybody. This uh, situation uh, must cause us to review a little some of his special findings in an effort, if possible, to see what we can do with the material he offers us. Always remembering that his quotations are probably correct and his interpretations on them probably incorrect, we have a wonderful opportunity in reading such material to preserve our own reference frame. We can resist the temptation to drift along with our author. Uh, we can pause and reflect, and in this way perhaps attain considerable mental discipline out of a book which, if read without criticism, might prove rather uh, disintegrating to a point of view. For example, early in his work, he begins to shatter uh, the conclusions and uh, foundations that had been built during the 18th, 19th, and the first decade of the 20th century. These conclusions pointed rather definitely to certain possible sources for Rosicrucianism. I concur with Mr. Waite fully in his realization that this society was not, as a society, an ancient institution, that all efforts to give it a mythological antiquity are essentially futile that even with the best possible research, we are unable to trace it back earlier than the opening years of the 17th century. We must, however, clearly differentiate between Rosicrucianism uh, as a formal organization and Rosicrucianism as a possible descent of mysticism, which in its proper right goes back a very long time. If, therefore, we wish to assume that the principles apparently concealed beneath the enigma of the rosy cross, if we consider these principles as ancient, we will be well justified. If, however, we consider the organization to be ancient, uh, we have absolutely no ground on which to stand. And I also am inclined to agree with Mr. Waite that uh, we cannot permit psychic revelation to fill this gap. Uh, we cannot assume that someone in a trance is, a is able to produce a valid history unless in that trance something is communicated by which reasonable investigation can be stimulated. Uh, the uh, idea of trying to fill these gaps with romance will not actually advance any cause to any great degree. In the uh, study of the origin of the society, most scholars have assumed that the original documents of the Rosicrucian Society were published by a German theologian who was uh, the religious and spiritual counselor of the Duke of Wittenberg one, Johann Valentin André. Uh, Mr. Waite dismisses this concept as being entirely incredible because it would require that the so-called chemical marriage of Christian Rosenkreutz, one of the earliest documents of the society, was written when André was only 24 years old. Uh, Mr. Waite regards this as an absurdity. He feels that uh, a work of this pretension, of this uh, depth, of this importance, could only have been the production of either a very mature person or one uh, of a group having considerable knowledge in common. I read the uh, chemical marriage of Christian Rosenkreutz, and this particular point of view that Mr. Waite advances uh, does not seem uh, to be valid so far as I am able to understand. Uh, Andre had available to him at that time 
an enormous quantity of alchemical and mystical literature. He uh, rose to uh, literary distinction at a time when there was a very large output of books dealing upon the general themes of his interest. A bright young man uh, taking this material could certainly have compiled the work which he produced. For this work is not exceptionally profound. It is not impossibly deep or incredibly wise. Uh, its uh, real uh, place in the literature of its time is determined almost entirely by its title. Therefore, has, if the word Christian, words Christian Rosenkreutz had been left off, this particular volume would have been only another remnant of early modern reform literature. In favor of the Andre hypothesis, there are certain other points uh, that we might mention. One of these is the uh, relationship uh, between Andre and Bacon. And here, Mr. Waite really has a bad time. It is obvious from the beginning that our English author is no Baconian. Uh, he regards the entire Baconian hypothesis as completely and entirely ridiculous. Here again, I sympathize with him, but I don't agree with him. The reason I don't agree with him is that certain definite links have been established. These are links Mr. Waite ignores, or else did not know them. And in either case, uh, they, uh, they represent valid evidence that um, there might be more to this phase of the subject than he is willing to admit. Now, the hypothesis that Lord Bacon might have been the founder of the Rosicrucian Society is at the outset not particularly attractive. Uh, in the first place, uh, the Bacon-Shakespeare controversy has caused a powerful alignment of opinions. And, of course, most of the scholarly opinion is on the side of Willie Shakespeare. Although I see that this is now being affected by the popular purse. Uh, the uh, Shakespearean Museum at Stratford-on-Avon is now asking for 250,000 uh, pounds to enlarge premises and facilities and make way for a larger tourist trade. Uh, several uh, individuals who might have something to do with finding the 250,000 pounds have uh, journeyed over to Stratford and taken a look around. Uh, they have come back, and their general opinion is that the Stratford Museum is about the largest fraud of its size in the world, that there is absolutely no evidence or proof in that museum that even one relic is authentic. And as to whether or not the building is the correct one, this is also largely open to question. And the general feeling is now that... Uh, it is hardly even possible that the immortal bard ever set foot in the Shakespeare house. It's not even certain that it was built at that time, but no one seems to worry too much about it. Na uh, naturally, we may expect a considerable tempest in a teapot over this particular issue, but in all probabilities, practical considerations will prevail and the funds will be raised simply because whether the relics are any good or not, people are perfectly willing to come and see them and pay moderately for the privilege of sitting in Willie's chair. Now, it happens that this chair has already been sold twice and taken out of the country, and it's still there. So you can uh, try to solve these mysteries. They're almost, they're almost as difficult to explain as the miraculous uh, multiplication of the bones of saints which have a tendency to show up, and one saint, I believe, has already known to have had seven skulls. This uh, difficult situation seems also to apply to the Shakespeare dilemma. We must also realize that young people have done rather well in their time. Young William Henry Ireland, a boy of 17, forged 
a complete Shakespearean play, and the immortal Samuel Johnson got down on his knees and kissed the edge of the manuscript. So youth does not necessarily deny precocity. The um, situation then involving the Baconian hypothesis is largely colored by other matters. And uh, we, we're not too sure of the ground on which we stand. Actually, there are many parallels between uh, the so-called adventures of our father CRC, the mysterious Christian Rosenkreutz of the chemical marriage, and uh, the somewhat better known Lord Verulam. Uh, these parallels were, however, advanced by the wrong people. Uh, they were advanced by enthusiasts. Uh, they were advanced by persons wearing the wrong school tie and things of that nature, and as a result were generally discredited. But whether they were advanced by wise or foolish men, the facts must stand on their own feet that there was a link between Andre and Lord Bacon seems to be part of our basic mystery. So I might mention a little episode that some of you may remember, but which others may not have come across in our writings. Back in 1926, 7 and 8, when I was working on this large book which I did on symbolism, word came to me that uh, one of the oldest and most important Masonic lodges in England, the Mother Kil Kilwinning Lodge of Scotland, had a very rare portrait of Lord Bacon as an old man. Uh, of course, uh, his lordship is supposed to have died at 66, but this portrait was supposed to be a picture of him at much greater age. The thought intrigued me, and full of youth and exuberance, I wrote the Mother Kilwinning Lodge through their secretary and asked if they had such a picture, and if so, they would be gracious enough to send me a copy of it. Uh, they were gracious enough, and uh, shortly after, the picture arrived. The picture was that of an elderly bearded gentleman with a long white beard and a black skull cap. And underneath and around the picture was the inscription, Johann Valentin André. I thought perhaps they'd sent me the wrong picture, so I wrote back and asked them if this was the picture of Bacon, and they assured me that it was. Now, what the Mother Kilwenning Lodge of Scotland might happen to know about this, I'm not too sure, but they seemed to feel that they knew what they were sending me. And uh, such an illustrious body... Uh, would not like to be passed off lightly. Another interesting point in relationship to this situation is found in the writings of John Burton, who were published anonymously under the title of Democritus Junior. The work which he did was called The Anatomy of Melancholy. And this, uh, as the name sounds, was a most uh, nostalgic volume which today would be an, a good textbook for certain specialists in abnormal psychology. But the book was full of all kinds of interesting notes and news, and as one man who contributed so many books and manuscripts to the Folger Library in Washington told me, he said many of us believe that this was originally Lord Bacon's scrapbook. But in any event, it is accredited to a Mr. Burton a very reverend gentleman of the Church of England. On one page of this book, uh, there is a reference to Christian Rosenkreutz, or the mysterious Father C.R.C. After this is the usual mark indicating a footnote, and below is the footnote. Johann Valentin André, comma, Lord Verulam, period. Now, this does not appear in all editions of the book, however, but it does appear in certain earlier editions. The only work that we know that describes the tomb of Christian Rosenkreutz uh, outside of the actual Rosicrucian manifestos is a work on mathematical magic by a Dr. Wilkins, 
who was a member of the society uh, which later became the, uh, the Royal Society of England and which, as uh, Spratt points out, was inspired by Bacon. Wilkin, Wilkins, in his book, describes the tomb with the ever-burning lamp in the ceiling and calls it the tomb of our illustrious brother, Francis Rosycross. Of course, Francis was Bacon's first name. And uh, certainly Francis is not, by any chance, a form of Christian. The manifesto says Christian Rosenkreutz. Wilkins, presumably with no typographical error in mind, calls him Francis Rosy Cross. There are numerous little odds and ends like this which Mr. Waits chooses to totally ignore. And therefore, I am not sure that he makes a, a strong case to prove uh, that the Rosicrucian enigma uh, had no place in the life of Lord Bacon. Also, if we remember the manifestos, Christian Rosenkreutz died uh, over a hundred years before the mysterious opening of his tomb. As this tomb was supposed to have been opened in the early years of the 17th century, the mysterious founder had been dead quite a long while. Uh, in the Dr. Burton's dear old book, already referred to, however, there is the statement, the founder of the Rosy Cross, still living. Now, this doesn't uh, quite fit in to uh, the picture, uh, for he couldn't be still living if the original text was correct. There seems to be no doubt in anyone's mind who really thinks this enigma through that uh, a group of persons, uh, perhaps definitely agents of esoteric orders, perhaps descendants uh, through the troubadours and the temple of ancient mystical associations, did get together in the beginning of the 17th century and formed a fraternity of some kind. Uh, it has been said of Lord Bacon that he rang the bell that brought the wits together, and there seems to be something of this nature involved in our controversy. There were only certain men of this time, if they had any reputation in letters at all, who can be intimately associated with a project of this nature. Uh, the uh, actual texts of the society issued between 1614 and 1616, uh, all of them are dated by their content. Even the chemical marriage is dated. It is dated to a way of life, to a point of view. And this dating definitely coincides with the Protestant Reformation. These works could only have come into existence after the rise of Lutheranism. We must, therefore, suspect that these books issued from some Protestant background. Uh, it would be almost incredible that they could have issued from any other background inasmuch as the very manifestos themselves indicate that the founder of the society brought back his knowledge and wisdom from the Arabs and from the Muslims, uh, which for most of Orthodox Europe would have been an unhappy background and not likely to cause confidence at that time. We had to have some group of intellectual liberals. Also, it is quite obvious from the text of the work that they centered around the concept of a universal reformation of mankind. They centered around the entire theory of the passing of an old way of life, that a new world was coming into existence, a world of new values, new human relationships, and that the fama and confessio fraternitatis were heralding in a great world change. Uh, this world change was naturally part of the period of, of which we are concerned, 
for actually the opening years of the 17th century differentiate the medieval period from the modern world. Of his discovery of the blood, the rise of the uh, philosophy of Bacon and Rene Descartes, uh, the emergence of the beginning of our scientific knowledge of astronomy, the creation of the Royal Society, or the exploration of all of the natural history of mankind. These movements were all part of what was referred to then as the way of tomorrowness, a looking into the future and the gradual building of a great structure of world knowledge founded upon the firm foundation of the inductive system of reason. Now, who would likely be able to spearhead such a movement? Only a person who had this look of tomorrowness, who was himself in some way concerned with the transition between Aristotelian scholasticism and the rise of modern humanism. It is said that our father, C.R.C., returning from his travels at Fez and Damka in North Africa and the Near East, returned or retired to a monastery, and there he began the compilation of the encyclopedia of all knowledge. It was his uh, purpose to prepare a work in which everything known to man might be made available to the scholars of this new age. He may have worked very hard, he might have been very industrious in his endeavors, but needless to say, no such a work ever appeared under his name, nor was any work uh, 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 available at the time at which he was supposed to have functioned. The only actual example of the type of work which he was devoted to was the instauratio magna of Lord Bacon. This was, as Bacon himself declared, to be an encyclopedia of all knowledge, necessary, useful, or possible to man. That he worked and labored through his years to produce this work, we know. And we also know that the Novum Organum, regarded as the first textbook of modern science, was Lord Bacon's masterpiece, and it was the first section of the Instauratio Magna. So here we have a man living at the time when the first manifestos were published, none were published earlier, doing the very work that the author of the unknown uh, book was said to be concerned with. There were many other parallels also. But we must find some explanation for the rise of a sudden point of view. We don't solve everything in this way, but I think we solve something. I think we become a little closer, come a little closer uh, to the necessary foundations of our subject. Mr. Waite, trying to explore his aspect of the field, makes a pretty thorough survey of the alchemists and the alchemistical philosophers who flourished uh, about the time of the beginnings of the Rosicrucian controversy or shortly before that time. He examines their elaborate symbolical works, their mystical theses, and their strange and wonderful formulas in an effort to discover, if possible, a route for Rosicrucianism in this area. Uh, naturally, he fails for the simple reason that these necessary links are not available according to his point of view. There is no evidence, for example, that the alchemistical philosophers ever used any of the essentially Rosicrucian devices or symbols. And there is no proof that the Rosicrucians ever actually made use of the alchemical symbols in any outward or common sense. 
There is only one possible uh, way in which these groups can be linked. There is every possibility that the alchemists were actually concerned with the same end, namely social regeneration, that concerned the Rosicrucian order. But the alchemists were a very spectacular group. Their wonderful old books are filled with the most elaborate diagrams and symbols. Uh, the regularly issued texts of the Rosicrucian Society are either unillustrated or but slightly so. They do not make use of these elaborate devices and designs, certainly not in the first circle of the apologists and supposed authors of the works. We may then have parallel motions, motions which might bridge at times. For if there were any Rosicrucians to be discovered, uh, the best candidates are among the alchemists. Also we realize that about the time that these manifestos of the Rosy Cross began to appear, there was a considerable impulse toward the elaboration of alchemical writings. Most of the best texts, most extravagantly illustrated volumes, were issued within 10 or 15 years of the appearance of the Rosicrucian manifestos. There is a package here somewhere, but the two groups seem to have at least a physical separation. They do not intermingle in the common sense of the word, although there are certain indications of possible sympathy between them. Arriving then at the beginning of the historical cycle of Rosicrucianism, we look around to see if we can names or persons that might well be associated with this society. Two names of well-known persons in the chemical and mystical literature of the period stand out. One was the English physician Robert Flood, and the other the German chemist Michael Meyer. Both of these men wrote about Rosicrucianism. Uh, Meyer in particular also wrote considerably about alchemy. The uh, Frankfurt publisher Theodore de Bry illustrated many of the writings of both of these men and also many emblem books and other significant volumes which appeared about the same time. Flood uh, writes quite enthusiastically about the Rosy Cross, gives a long and learned discourse about the habits of the Brotherhood, which actually says nothing, and then at the end states clearly that he claims no membership. This sort of uh, eliminates him uh, unless we wish to assume that he lied in print. Uh, the other possible candidate that we have, uh, Michael Meyer, who was a nobleman and a counselor to his king, uh, does write also about the Rosicrucians. He discusses them and mentions them and describes their habitations in Germany. But before he gets through, he also proves conclusively that he knew nothing about them. The next uh, important work comes out is also by Meyer, called The Laws of the Fraternity of the Rosy Cross. Here, Meyer really does quite an impressive job. He writes a small book in which he gives all the rules, laws, and proper uh, credo of the society. Unfortunately, however, he once again says nothing. For all he has done is taken the original material in the Fama and enlarged upon it. He has made extensive definitions of the various rules briefly stated there. But when we get through with the book, he has really added nothing new. So we summarize the situation as it stands in the 17th century. Three books appear. The Fame and Confession of the Society of the Rosy Cross, published in 1614, possibly available as early as 1612, uh, somewhat, sometime in manuscript. It is believed they were circulated. And a third work, The, the Chemical Marriage of Christian Rosenkreutz, 
which appeared two years later. Now in the fame and confession, our illustrious brother CRC is never referred to by anything except initials. He is delivered to us as Christian Rosenkreutz only in the chemical marriage. Now the question that must further be established is, from a critical standpoint, is the chemical marriage in any way an actual manifesto of the society? Flood did equally well in writing on Rosicrucian material at the same time, and at the end and insists that he doesn't know the order and has never met a member of it. Meyer did a splendid job in, with the same negative uh, conclusion. Uh, therefore, as the fame and confession had been in circulation for two years, are we really entitled to assume that the chemical marriage was an actual official production of the society, or was it one of the many loggia that appeared during the next five or ten years? We like to assume for practical purposes that it probably was directly or indirectly a manifesto. If it can be traced to Bacon, we probably have every reason to assume that it was a genuine work. Whether we can trace the fame and confession to Bacon is another problem. But here again, you can have a lot of fun. It is assumed that the author of all of these works, that is, of the fame and confession, was a German. And, of course, it is assumed that the author of The Chemical Marriage was a German. While these works may have been published in Germany, the German author had some troubles. When he got stuck for a word which might be a little unusual in German, he usually used an English word, which might possibly imply that English was his mother tongue, or it may have been put there on purpose to create this question in the mind of the reader. Anyway, it is a valid question. For in an emergency or in some strange abstraction of learning of uh, language, uh, it might well be that we would fill in with some word more familiar to us. But let us assume for the moment that these three books were all genuine productions. We have to question the appendix of the Fama Fraternitatis, wherein this was uh, to this was added a small work by Boccolini an Italian author on the universal reformation of mankind. It was all of a theme, but this work only appears in one edition of the Fame and Confession. So here we are with three books looking for an author. These three books stand completely alone, and every effort to tie them successfully to any other group of literature seems to be little better than useless. Uh, Wait comes to this conclusion that these three books stand alone, and then he begins to ask himself whether these books stand, or whether the whole uh, group of volumes fall together. This is a question which I, I don't think we can fairly take. I prefer the more moderate course of assuming that some person or persons, with a real and definite purpose, and perhaps speaking for a private society devoted to esoteric, mystical, or even religio-political activities, did issue these manifestos. That for one reason or another, nothing further transpired. We were assured that these would appear in many languages. Actually, they did not. The only time when they appeared in any other language was much later when they were translated. They were not simultaneously issued in five tongues or anything of that nature. And uh, the various announcements and pronouncements contained within the volumes uh, seemingly never were fulfilled. To show how the situation was in the year of grace 1616, uh, it, it, we might have to compare it to some strange thing that might arise today, where suddenly there would be thrown upon us a most solemn and uh, apparently official document affirming the existence of some strange or secret government uh, and inviting us all to join 
in this great movement for the regeneration of mankind. Uh, small, fr uh, fragmentary, splinter movements of this kind have appeared at frequent intervals, but have never amounted to anything. So the excitement grew immediately. Men of tomorrowness, whether they were affiliated with anything or not, were greatly moved by the dignity, the humanity, the nobility of these manifestos, and all were most anxious to join. So that at that moment, uh, the society had its best press, and there was a tremendous popular interest. Everybody began to look around, and there's uh, a very interesting contemporary records dealing with this subject. Alchemists began searching desperately because they believed uh, these Rosicrucian brothers or adepts probably had the secrets of the transmutation of metals, the mystery of eternal youth, and uh, the medicine or the elixir of life. So they, uh, they were searching for them. Uh, pro progressive political leaders were very anxious to be affiliated with this organization. Philosophers, scholars, divines, clergymen, even priests, bishops, were doing everything they could to find out where these brothers were. And the, the furor got greater and greater. But there wasn't any address to address a letter to. There wasn't anyone who seemed to be able to give any information whatsoever. Uh, letters sent to mysterious adepts were always returned unopened. Uh, at the same time, of course, as well might be expected, a whole group of charlatans masquerading under weird titles and looking important drifted through various communities were immediately identified as Rosicrucians. Uh, but again, these evaporated without very much uh, contribution to the public good. One uh, early description of such an adept is contained in a delightful little book called The Complete History of an Unknown Man. This is uh, exactly what it was. And when you got through with the history, the man was still completely unknown. Uh, the only thing about him that was demonstrable as any of any historical significance was that he was a sort of a Pied Piper, for he uh, went into one ger small German town and whistled all the rats out of the houses. This was his only claim uh, to Rosicrucian identification. Uh, the uh, hopelessness of trying to communicate with these brothers left only one uh, alternative, the want ad column. Now, of course, at that time, newspapers were not really what they are today. In fact, in Venice, newspapers were still being written by hand, one copy for each subscriber. So this wasn't very successful. The only thing that appeared to be feasible was to publish small booklets, oh, 10, 15, 20 pages, some of them only eight pages, in which some aspiring candidate would state his qualifications assure the Brotherhood that he would be their dedicated servant, and to please let him know where to reach them, then these booklets were published in small numbers of 500 or 1,000 and circulated throughout Europe in the hope that they would fall into the hands of one of the brothers, and he in turn would communicate with the aspirant to membership. Probably 50 or 100 of such publications are already known, and there were undoubtedly many more. Again, however, these were not effective because the writers of them, most of them later wrote other works complaining that their first brochures were ignored. So we had this little cycle of literature that uh, only supports the fact that in 1616 the adepts of the Rosy Cross were as difficult to find as they are now. And uh, situations didn't really better much. But we uh, should take uh, go along with some consecutive thought and try to feel out the situation a little further. Gradually, another type of literature arose. Uh, as the uh, Rosicrucians decided not to speak for themselves, uh, a very interesting but not necessarily enlightening group of apologists appeared. 
among the apologists being our friends Meyer and Flood. These apologists would write an elaborate manifesto, thesis, document, or perhaps even a fine large folio in small print. The substance of the book being that if the Rosicrucians wished to remain unknown, it was their right to do so, and nobody had any reason to question it. Well, to wade through 250 pages of medieval Latin to learn this was itself rather disappointing. These apologists, however, gradually developed imaginations, which is not uncommon and is still a practice found among mystical writers. Uh, not being able to learn anything else, they began to decide for themselves what Rosicrucianism was. And uh, by, six, by 1650, we had a dozen or more fine texts on the subject, no two of which agreed with each other, and each one of them propounding to expound the original mystery of the fraternity. I can agree with Mr. Waite in the fact that you can read them all and gain nothing. Some of them are very interesting. Most of them are a bit desperate. Uh, several of them are uh, permeated with a general atmosphere of futility. But after a time, uh, we find another note coming in namely the quest for the fast dollar. And even as early as 1650, uh, people were not completely without that little mercenary twist of mind. By the 50s and 60s, a whole group of self-proclaimed Rosicrucians were available to anyone who wished to sample their fare. They uh, wrote extensively. One of them was uh, John Hayden who did quite an elaborate uh, series of works uh, in his holy guide describing the temples, palaces, and shrines of the Rosicrucian fraternity in England. Unfortunately, he failed to give any locations, and therefore uh, we got too, not too much comfort or consolation, but he did write with great erudition. In fact, he had ideas that no one before him or since have uh, ever fallen upon or really adequately quoted. By the end of the 17th century, by 1680 or 90, the situation had reached a dead end. Uh, it passed into a dignified limbo. Uh, the original society had never claimed uh, any uh, distinction by its action. It had never come forth and revealed itself. Its early circle of apologists were gone. The secondary circle were already mingling their Rosicrucian interests again with the stream of alchemy and hermetic arts. And these, in turn, were beginning to wane under the impact of the rise of experimental science. Minds were now turning more to chemistry and archaeology and antiquities and the development of various remedies based upon scientific knowledge. So everything remained comparatively quiet until the beginning of the 18th century, when we had quite a revival of Rosicrucian thinking. This second cycle, uh, however, begins to take on an entirely different color. We now find the subject becoming more and more involved in ritualism and ceremonialism. Uh, the rise of Rosicrucian secret societies. These societies sprang up in many areas. There is no evidence or proof that they had any foundations in the original order, but at that time communication was poor, the public mind was uh, open to almost any innovation, and the general difficulties politically of the countries of Europe seemed to cause people to take particular interest in something of a hopeful, idealistic, or mystical nature. These secret societies did gather into themselves a number of interesting people, some of them rather brilliant people. But it cannot be said that the mainstream of the subject was in any way enriched. In fact, it perhaps was a little impoverished, because now the old landmarks were pretty much obscured unless you had the time, patience, and wealth to investigate the original sources. 
This drifted along through most of the 18th century. And during this time also, we began to find the rise of Masonic fraternities, uh, both regular and irregular, in various parts of Europe. Freemasonry developed a, a kaleidoscope of degrees. Every uh, inventive and ingenious individual had another Masonic right. Uh, this situation continued to uh, compound itself until there was really no rhyme or reason left in the gradually developing structure of Freemasonry. Finally, in the, near the end of the 18th century, the great Congress of Willemsbad was brought together, uh, convened for the purpose of clarifying the Masonic situation. Among the uh, delegates at this Congress, by the way, were two names also associated sometimes with Rosicrucianism, the Count Cagliostro and the Count de Saint Germain. These were delegates at the Congress of Wilhelmsbad. As a result of that, Masonry cleaned house and relegated most of its uh, doubtful degrees uh, to the historical and archaeological uh, department. And again, Rosicrucianism uh, waned and became more or less concerned or involved in certain specialized groups of Masonic scholars. The 19th century didn't add a great deal to this picture. Uh, it did, however, clarify the Masonic position in connection with the Rosicrucian order. Uh, movements arose of Masonic research and scholarship, like the uh, Lodge of the Quarter Coronati in London, the Lodge of the Four Kings, which was the great Masonic research lodge, which worked with old beliefs, legends, rituals, degrees, and more or less became involved in the Rosicrucian controversy through the, its overlapping membership. One of the members, Dr. W. Wynn Westcott, was also the head of the Societas Rosicrucianus in Anglia, which was a Freemasonic auxiliary uh, devoted to Rosicrucian studies admission requiring that the candidate be a master mason. Uh, during the latter part of this century, a great American Masonic scholar, uh, General Albert Pike, a sovereign grand commander of the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry of the Southern Jurisdiction, received an invitation from Europe to found a Masonic Rosicrucian Auxiliary in this country. I have seen the correspondence in the House of the Temple at Washington, and if my memory does not fail me, the letter was answered by General Pike's son. And in this letter, the son points out that his father is now in too advanced years and too heavily burdened with other responsibilities to undertake the establishment of a Masonic uh, research body in, uh, of Rosicrucian interest in the United States. So that the Masonic end, as far as this country is concerned, ends more or less in this way, although one small Masonic research group, the Society Rosicruciana in America, was founded and did flourish for a little while in the northern jurisdiction of the Scottish Rite. Beyond this point, the Rosicrucian controversy uh, more or less fades out so far as Masonic, alchemical, political, and uh, illuminist problems are concerned. And in the late years of the 19th century and in the opening years of the 20th century, Rosicrucianism took on very largely the aspect of a Christian theosophy and as such uh, did create and does maintain uh, organizations in this country uh, dealing perhaps to a degree with Rosicrucian problems, but very largely concerned with mysticism or with the uh, esoteric aspects of man's life. None of these organizations are able to use any of the original texts as a basic text for their own work, however, because no text of the original order dealing with any of its mystical practices or beliefs is known to exist. Now, Mr. Waite takes on another position here, which perhaps is of some interest to us. He now assumes that the entire descent of the Rosicrucian society was completely secret, uh, that it is actually impossible 
to trace either its doctrine or its ritual from any exoteric organization that has appeared. That there are certain fraters or brothers of the society that have, as in the old Pythagorean school, perpetuated their knowledge by selecting disciples to succeed them, and that this small group has descended over a long period of time, and that somewhere here and there, scattered about, are legitimate Rosicrucians. At this point, Mr. Waite becomes extremely hedgy and uh, takes on an atmosphere of almost uh, uh, unctuous humility and leaves us with somewhat the impression that perhaps he might be one of them. But as he doesn't seem to have courage enough to say so, perhaps he shouldn't have brought it up in the first place. Because, again, his findings do not indicate any unusual possession of information in this area.